Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Mercy Changes the World, Call to be Missionary Disciples of Mercy. I am Jonathan Sitko, the Assistant Director of Programs for the Catholic Apostles Center, and I'll be your host this evening as we welcome our guest speakers, Father Andrew Small, National Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies, and Marilyn Santos, Director of Mission Education, also the Pontifical Mission Societies. We're very pleased to have both of them speaking on this topic tonight. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, please send me a message in the chat box on the bottom right of the screen, and I'll be able to help you out. Now I'll turn it over to Father Andrew and Marilyn and leave you in their capable hands. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Pontifical Mission Societies to the National Office here located in New York City. Um, as you know, I'm Father Andrew Small, the National Director, and I'm with Marilyn, who can Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Say hello. Uh, in this World Mission Month, um, it's good that we've got this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about missionary discipleship, missionary cooperation. Uh, mission is a word that's used so much today by religious and non-religious organizations. Uh, so at least this year we get a chance, uh, thanks to this great medium, to talk to you a little bit about what we do and, and how we uh, are looking at that and, and trying to implement the Lord's mandate to go and make disciples uh, of all nations. Let's begin as we always do with a prayer. Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we ask you to be with us during this time of reflection, this time of deepening your word, a word that liberates, that sends us out, that brings the good news of Jesus Christ, especially to those who are in need of that comforting word, that liberating, that saving word. Make us faithful, make us worthy missionaries of your gospel, faithful in the one communion. And to quote from the Holy Father's prayer for this year of mercy, let us pray. Send your spirit and consecrate every one of us with its anointing so that the Jubilee of Mercy may be a year of grace from the Lord, and your church, with renewed enthusiasm, may bring good news to the poor, proclaim liberty to captives and the oppressed, and restore sight to the blind. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, it is. It's great to be with you here. Uh, in our national office, actually in the place that we call the Fulton Sheen uh, Media Room. Uh, many people will be familiar with the work and the life of the great Fulton Sheen, who was the national director of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little while. It's one of the Pontifical Mission Societies uh, back in uh, 1950, from 1950 to 1966. So that explains some of the technical equipment you can see behind us where we keep that spirit of communicating the gospel alive. As we move through our, our presentation, just a, an initial word that we are the Pontifical Mission Society. It's pontifical in the sense that it's a, an organization that is being given a specific uh, direction, mandate, responsibility from the Holy Father himself. Uh, we like to call him, and he is known through some of the documents, as our chief missionary. Uh, of course, Jesus Christ is the great missionary who came from the bosom of the Father uh, to us to bring us the good news. The Holy Father, as the vicar of Christ, as the successor of Peter, is the one who cares for uh, and perpetuates that mission received from the Lord himself to go out to all the nations and to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Father has that mission, and he delegates it in a very special way in its organizational capacity to us as the Pontifical Mission Societies present all over the world to bring that good news to those in the missions. Uh, and we'll get around in a little while to what exactly uh, that means. It's to make missionary discipleship the core of what it means to be church. The church is missionary by her very nature, as we're taught by the Second Vatican Council. What does that mean? It means that we are constantly finding ways to bring that good news to others. And the church has a very concrete, visible 
sense of reality and of community uh, brings that to people all around the world. And the Pontifical Mission Society has been given the job to coordinate that role. We're certainly not the only ones doing it, uh, since bringing the good news is the obligation of, of every baptized Christian. Uh, we have a particular role in focusing on that, intensifying it, and trying to constantly keep us in touch with those various units and places where the sacraments are celebrated, where the good news is preached. We do that principally in two fundamental ways, through the, 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 the gift of prayer, uh, promoting that and stimulating that. Um, of course, we need to be formed in our faith, so uh, mission education and an understanding of the missionary dimension to our work, something that Marilyn will talk about in a little while. And also sacrifice. Um, as we know, um, the church is very good and very famous for taking up its collection. Uh, ever since that early church, uh, there were squabbles, but also there were great debates around how we can keep our mission going in a very concrete way. So supporting the missionary work of the church and missionaries, uh, particularly those in places of poverty, those on the peripheries, is a big part of what we do. Most of it uh, still is directed towards uh, the youngest, younger churches, uh, even though I'm sure they don't feel so young, uh, mostly in Asia uh, and in Africa. It's where generally the church would be a little uh, on the weaker side. Uh, it wouldn't have enough personnel, enough structures. It's still depending a lot on what comes from outside. The church does so much good. But at the end of the day, we remember it's just the church. It's not a non-government organization. Uh, the church, as we will see, has uh, many, many people and places and a tremendous reach amongst the most needy in our world. Uh, it can't do that uh, if it's not fully the church, if people aren't convinced of and taken over by the power of God's word in their lives. So we're not a non-government organization. We're not uh, a charity just engaged in humanitarian work. Uh, we are the church doing what the church is, call, is called to do, uh, to bring glad tidings to the poor, but also to bind up those who are broken, to lift up the weak, to, to educate those who don't have access to education, all the good things that make us fully human. But it's done exclusively with church personnel. So you'll see a lot of photos of uh, religious sisters and priests and lay catechists. Uh, the church being the church, we should like to remember that, where we distinguish ourselves from being a, uh, a, a private voluntary organization or a charity or those who are doing other good works, but are not apprised with the need to fundamentally proclaim the gospel and to witness to it all over the world. You might wonder what exactly it is that the church is doing. And I was talking to somebody recently who said, we need to get our message out more. The church is so much that is wonderful around the world, and it's not often very obvious and evident, especially if you're speaking to folks who uh, don't know so much about the Catholic Church. They would be surprised and wide-eyed to see some of the numbers that you might see on the screen right now. 71,000 kindergartens with, over, with nearly 8 million pupils. This is the work of the mission church, primary schools, secondary schools. These are run by dioceses, religious sisters, religious priests, associated with Catholic institutions. And we, as the Pontifical Mission Societies, are basically the primary supporter of them through the annual funding that we're able to do and to distribute. Of course, they have their own channels of funding at this stage, and we encourage them uh, to look for other sources. But some group within the church has to be the core supporter, the core supplier of the material help that, uh, that various parts of the church needs, particularly in education, healthcare, in outreach, in times of emergency, all done through religious personnel. As you can see, social service centers, healthcare, uh, with lay missionaries numbering almost uh, 363,000. Uh, a huge amount of folks who have heard the call to spread that good news and to make God's kingdom real around the world. 
The church can do wonderful things, as we know, but it can't do anything if there's no church. And so we are responsible for, as is every uh, baptized Catholic, for ensuring that that mission of God's uh, salvation is not just affective, it doesn't just uh, take over people's hearts and minds and make them convinced to be missionaries, but that it's effective as well, that we have ways of making that concrete in today's world. Here's just a few little examples of what goes on in the 1111, yes, I checked it, it was 1111, we didn't just uh, keep hitting the one on the, uh, on the computer uh, keyboard. That's the number of mission dioceses and archdioceses around the world, um, all of Africa, most of Asia, uh, some in parts of Latin America and other parts of, of, uh, of Europe. Um, and I'll explain in a little bit how those dioceses are selected, but they're the ones that we're responsible for reaching out to and knitting together the fabric of the church's life. You saw that, for example, in, in, uh, in Western Kenya, there was a, a, a huge uh, uh, drought, as there often is, and lots of uh, aid came in, and folks were very generous, and governments were very helpful. But oftentimes, the ability to reach those folks and to be there before the crisis and after the crisis is not always uh, very common and very easy. Uh, you saw the sisters there. Uh, we had a collection for them, and they were able to support very concretely the people that they felt were on, on the outs and not uh, being uh, taken care of, uh, helping children in the after-school programs, etc. Uh, another little example is uh, the what we might call the persecuted church. Those places where the church is not able to um, preach the good news freely. Uh, and we saw in various places, uh, most recently in Vietnam, where the church continues to have its uh, yeah, its wings clipped or its uh, abilities severely hampered by uh, government regulations. Um, how those who are committed and are seen as as uh, missionaries of the faith, missionaries of mercy, are able to continue that despite the difficulties and support uh, baptisms of hundreds of thousands of Catholics, the 1,500 seminarians are in training. As we know, oftentimes where there is great suffering and persecution, there'll also be a great flourishing of the faith. Um, so we we'll, we see that uh, in in Vietnam, which is very much a place of persecution, but but also a great light. Um, the church obviously spreads the faith, uh, educating parents, baptizing their children, celebrating the sacraments, preparing people for, for communion, confession, um, preparing couples for marriage, uh, being there uh, at times of difficulty, but it's also, as we know, uh, a very concrete um, uh, presence in the world. Uh, with its establishment of, of uh, schools and clinics and hospitals and centers of, of welcome for refugees and, and, and supporting immigrants and those who are, are left out. That's where the church will be. You see some statistics there, particularly around the role of the church amongst uh, people who are blind. Uh, and not only in a random way, but then we will have very specific religious orders, groups of men and women from various countries who will emerge and they will take up that apostolate in a direct way. This is something that's well known to many of you. The Pontifical Mission Societies as such, and there are four of them, um, they are called the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, which is responsible for all of those 1111 dioceses and their internal workings. We have the uh, Missionary Childhood Association of Children Helping Children, which is to foster that missionary uh, spirit amongst, um, amongst younger people. And then we have um, the Society for St. Peter uh, the Apostle, what they call the Native Clergy, which was to support the formation and development of local seminarians from the local cultures, and also um, uh, local religious vocations, many, many local religious sisters who also uh, are, are there being, uh, being formed because of the great support done. And then the Missionary Society 
the Mission Reunion for Priests and Sisters, which is kind of a think tank. So there are four of them, uh, and they go back to the earliest days to the French woman you see of the Pauline Jaricot, whose brother was a missionary in China. She wanted to be a missionary, and uh, she came from a well-to-do family. And she had a severe illness, and during that time of recovery, she had a vision of two lamps. One lamp was empty, one lamp was full, and she received the call to fill the empty lamp with the lamp that was full, with the oil from the lamp that was full. Only in this scenario, the full lamp was the missions, was the church and the missions, and the empty lamp was the church in France at the time, ravaged in the wake of the... Um, of the French Revolution and all that was going through there, these new ideas, these new post-religion ideas where the God was pushed aside and the, and the secular principles um, were being brought forward, being told that we don't need a sense of God so much, it should be put aside and suppressed. Pauline was a young woman who spent her entire life getting people together in circles of ten to give a penny a week, a penny and a prayer a week. Uh, and she died in a pauper's grave, having uh, spent her entire fortune and her entire life and doing everything she could to help others. So she's the founder of the Society for Propagation of the Faith going back to uh, 1822, and we've been following that legacy ever since. Uh, she, that's the largest and perhaps the most significant and the one that is responsible for celebrating Mission Month. The others have their different times throughout the year. I'm uh, the National Director of the United States, where we have a mission uh, office and a, a representative of the Pontifical Mission Societies in every diocese. According to canon law, uh, the structure of the church requires that somebody be appointed by the bishop responsible for the missions uh, in an especial way responsible for the Pontifical Mission Societies. As the National Director, I have 120 colleagues, uh, and whatever we collect throughout the year, we all report that to Rome. We don't send it to Rome, we report it to Rome. And then in May each year and in November in a lesser way, we go and get together and we decide what is it that we should be doing with the finances? What should we be doing with all these generous offerings of Catholics from around the world? And we look at the most needy parts of the world, the parts of the church, whether it's been uh, ravaged by natural disaster or civil war. Think of the church in Syria right now. Uh, think of what was happening to the church and uh, is continuing to be persecuted in northern Nigeria, in Pakistan, uh, in Egypt during the, the uprising there. All places where from time to time the church will need special attention. And uh, and we get together 120 of us from all around the world. Uh, and now to say there's one in every diocese, a, a director in every diocese. I'm going to hand this over to uh, Marilyn now, and she's going to uh, yeah. You can hear a different voice for a little while, <laughs> and uh, she'll tell us a little bit more about, about the work that we do. Great. We just thought we were going to have a little poll here, so we want to hear from, from you all who are on live with us. If you see on your screen, um, Joe has put it up. What role do you serve? Oh, actually, that is not our poll. Um, okay. That uh -huh. is the poll. That is the poll that you've had for the... I guess the World Youth Day <laughs> webinar that you had. Okay, uh, human error. So we will see um, if Joe can find our poll, and so that we don't, we we will move on for there. Why don't we? We can, we'll move on, and then we will um we will get come back to the poll. So I'm gonna actually uh, hand it back to Father. I know that he um he spoke a little bit about World Mission Sunday, which is co coming up really soon. So that's a very special day of the year for us, especially as members of the Pontifical Mission Societies. Sure, yeah, thank you. And you see the the title of this year's uh, World Mission Sunday, um, which is Mercy Changes the World. And it's based upon this year of mercy, Jubilee Year of Mercy, that the Holy Father has called for us. Um, mercy Changes the World, and it's celebrated in the second to last a Sunday in October, October, which this year is, if I'm calling correctly, it's October 23rd. October 23rd. So that's World Mission Weekend, let's say, though, and there's a special collection, and hopefully the uh, folks in the parishes and schools will talk uh, in a special way about um, World Mission Sunday. And we have a collection, and we're very grateful 
for the donations that come in at that time. There's a second collection. Uh, as we know, they come up very often. Well, this one, uh, this time of the year, is for the missions around the world. And the Holy Father this year sent a message, which I encourage everybody to download, um, in which he talks about the importance of mercy. And in it, he, if you read his message, it's a brief message. Um, and you can see, excuse me, I'm talking an awful lot. <clears throat> you can see that he, he looks at the word mercy in its origins, hesed. And he says that the word mercy has a very special place in the relationship between a mother and her child, a child within her womb. That's how she feels towards that child. It's a very strong image. Uh, the Holy Father speaks about this maternal uh, image of God. Uh, God as not just father, which is the traditional sense, but also the maternal motherly sense of that child that the mother never forgets within her womb. Even though the mother forgets, he says, I don't forget. I carved it on the palm of my hand. As we know, October is also pro-life month. So it is a lovely mix between that sense of a protection of life, but also that relationship of mercy that we should have, not just for the child within the womb or the child in the womb, but for also those who are hungry and thirsty for God's message of salvation. So uh, that happens. This year it's the um, 90th anniversary. It was founded in 1926 by Pope Pius XI, and it was requested that there be not just a collection, since we know that they have uh, collections around the year, uh, but that there would be a special liturgical celebration. As you know, we don't generally trump the the Sunday Mass. We don't we don't put different readings and and prayers during the Sunday Mass. We follow that very consistently. But this year, but this time of year, there is always the option. It's not obligatory, although it's uh, to be encouraged. When the priest or the pastor will select those readings that celebrate uh, the Mass for the evangelization or the spreading of the gospel of all people. So that makes it a very particular celebration in many parishes. And if you if you can find the number of your local diocese, you can call them up and ask to speak to the mission office, and they might have some special celebrations, as many many dioceses do have a, a special world celebration for the missions. So that's what's happening this year. Maybe I'll turn it back to Marilyn, and we've rather moved on from our poll, <laughs> or, we, or, we, or we, can, we can just power forward. Sure, we can, we can power forward. Um, and the images that you saw of World Vision Sunday, hopefully some of you um, have already seen them because th those are posters that um, we have made available through our offices in your parishes, so it would be great. Um, so the next time you see it, um, you, can, you can think of us. So what we have up here is just a little bit more, um, some great pictures there, so one picture that you might recognize them, just to give you a little bit more information of the, of the type of work that we do that, um, it, as Father has so beautifully explained, really makes a difference in the day-to-day -day life. It, you know, our Catholic faith is meant to be holistic. It's the whole person. So we have a little boy named Peter, who Father had um, the, the really the blessing to actually get to travel to Zambia and meet. Uh, what you cannot see in the picture, because what you see is just his beautiful smile, but is that Peter actually, when Father met him, was missing his legs. Uh, he was in a, a horrible accident. Uh, he was, you know, like little boys tend to do, they, they run. Anybody who's a mother or ever babysat knows that a three- or four-year-old can be very squirrely. So he was uh, run over by a train. Um, but, again, the church was able to step in and, and care for him. And this was a few years ago. My understanding is that Peter now has prosthetics. So uh, because of the work, um, of the sisters and of the good lay missionaries down there and the support of the Pontifical Mission Society, children like Peter with that, that beautiful face. And then if you look over here, we've got these two beautiful little girls in Peru, and they're just another example of just the, just the hundreds upon hundreds of work. These little girls happen to live in El, El Oriente, the Amazon of Peru, and there we've got a couple of communities of sisters who um, dedicated themselves to educate the children. So they really supply everything, not just the education, but even, as you can see, the little girls are wearing uniforms and the little shirts. Uh, most of the sisters actually will hand sew the uniforms and really provide everything 
Um, and many times it actually includes food. And for a lot of these young children, uh, the meal that they get at the school is really the only guaranteed healthy full meal that they can have um, during the day. Uh, in India, um, Sister Clara there, as you see on the on the um, left side of the screen, uh, she is a Salesian sister, and she and her community of sisters are really doing an incredible job of rescuing uh, children who are being sold, um, really, uh, slavery. They with the domestic work or or hotel work or the industries, really children who have, for various reasons, ended up on the street. And Sister and um, her community are really are rescuing these um, children, often girls. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times um, the girls are the ones who are put in these positions a lot more. Um, like in northern Thailand, you see there in the other picture, Sister's Ministry there is specifically with young women who are actually been um, human trafficking. So they've actually been sold into um, uh, prostitution. And, and the, they are saving, saving them, educating them, providing them with a safe haven, and teaching them trades or, uh, so they can actually be gainfully employed and they learn not to, to advocate for themselves and not to be exploited. So those are just, um, just uh, we, we have hundreds of these stories that, that we could share with you, and I'm sure that some of you are aware of um, other similar situations that, that happen. What we have on the screen, though, I'm just curious, those of you who are on, I know that the, the title of this webinar includes Missionary Disciple. I think that um, most of us, if, if we could raise our hands, have been hearing this uh, particular terminology perhaps a little bit more than maybe we did 5, 10, 15 years ago. So I, I would love to open that up just for a few moments. Some of, some of you as can use your chat feature, or if you want to um, open up your microphones, um, how, what is a missionary disciple? If, if you were put on the spot, you know, like some of these late night shows where you know the roving reporter were to ask you that question, and um, how would how would you answer that? Just give me a few minutes. Don't be shy. Okay, let's see. Joseph says, someone who is able to speak to anyone about the gospel. And remember, there are no right or wrong answers, so this is not a test. Anybody else have something that they'd like to contribute? Or respond to Joseph? Let's see. Sarah has said, someone who acts on their faith daily, it's not something that is done merely in the church building. Excellent. Feel free to continue adding in the chat if something occurs to you, if you want to share something. While we're looking, um, I'm just going to vote went up on the screen is Pope Francis, I think we would all agree, um, he talks about this a lot. I, I think that, um, you know, if we want to say, you know, he's made this popular. Um, and, you know, he talks that in Evangelii Gaudium, he gives us kind of a definition. He says it's baptism that makes us missionary disciples. So in other words, um, if you're baptized, you're a missionary disciple. There is later on um, the same document, Evangelii Gaudium, where he talks about how you really, um, you can never have those separate. You cannot talk about missionary and discipleship as two separate things. That the two always be are together. And someone, um, actually Joseph, I, you read my slides because again, missionary discipleship is about sharing the gospel, the good news. We have Lisa um, Gomes who said, uh, someone who is a witness to Jesus, and that is her her sharing. The Pope in that same document. Also, he makes quite a statement here. I know when I first read through it, I read this quite a few times because I thought, you know, this is quite a, a huge challenge that he's putting forth for us when he says that he dreams of a missionary option. In other words, I'm going to paraphrase it, really everything that we do say, the, the lens we look at the world should be 
through this lens of looking at it as a missionary. And he firmly believes that that is what's going to help us, uh, enable us to, to, change to, world, to change the world. So he also reminds us that what we're called to do is to go beyond our comfort zone. We, we talk a lot, you know, at the end of the Mass, uh, the, the final word of the celebrant is go. Um, it, it's not um, see you next Sunday and, and do nothing. And once again, especially this year in the Year of Mercy, what Pope Francis is really reminding us, um, and I say reminding us because this is not new. This is a, as a faith. This is something that uh, we've always believed in. It's always been part of our, our core beliefs. But particularly, Pope Francis is really doing um, a, a great job of, of reminding us really explicitly that when we go out, we have to remember that we do it with mercy, that we don't go out judgmentally, that we just go out with open hearts and open hands um, and, and, and receive and, and see how we can, as some of you have said, you know, how do I witness to Jesus, it's in the way I treat others. So then, we know this. I'm sure that a lot of you who are on the call um, have had these conversations, you know. So then what it comes down to is, well, then how do I do it? How do I teach it? How do I get other people or animate our communities um, to live out this missionary discipleship, especially our young people? Uh, we know that you know we we've heard it's they're not just the they're not only the future of the church they're the actual present. So when we work with young people, you know, one thing is to know now how do I get them to not just know it in their heads but to know it in their hearts and actually uh, have it become an integral part of, of who they are. So I thought if we're going to talk about young people, let's just look at some facts about, well, who are they? You know, we, uh, we hear a lot of talk about them. Uh, I noticed um, there's even a bunch of new TV shows that are out that are talking a lot about this millennial generation. But let's just get an accurate snapshot of them. So there's a bunch of little facts there. You know, they're, they're diverse. Um, family is important. They actually, um, they call it the mirroring with their parents, that there's a lot less conflict. They Their, their core beliefs, um, uh, what what they stand for, including religion and all sorts of social factors, tend to be pretty much the same as their parents. Uh, they do um, the way that they socialize is different. Um, they don't tend to think long term. So, and and I know that we've experienced a lot when it comes to jobs. You know, this is a group that doesn't already. I'm going to take this job, and I know that I'm going to be here five, ten, fifteen years. And this is my career. They do that, but they're very. Um, Self-motivated, they're doers. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, part of that has also led to a decline, and um, we've all heard about the nuns, which you know, one in three of 18 to 29-year-olds do not affiliate with a an organized um, denomination. Uh, they consider they believe in God. Uh, they do. Um, they self-report that they actually do pray, but they um, have decided that they're not going to affiliate with. Um, uh, a, a specific denomination. Um, they see being religious as a choice, as opposed to some of us that, are, as our faith was handed on to us by our parents, um, it wasn't ever a question. Of course, I'm born Catholic. I'm always going to be Catholic. They also see any service as a choice. Um, but they actually, um, when asked about religion, even the nuns, they, one of the most positive things that they correlate with people who belong to denominations is the service. Uh, obviously, they, their friendships are important. Um, and this is the group that sometimes we make fun of them because we say everybody gets the trophy. But the, the, the positive side of that is because they see success as a group that's more important to them as opposed to um, I won and I'm the one who's getting the gold medal. And of course, technology makes them extremely unique. Um, Kara recently did a poll. I, I know when I saw some of these numbers, I actually um, was a little surprised as well. Uh, almost half of them have volunteer, and almost, again, half of them also said that helping the poor was very important, and they also list um, that it's what it means to be a Catholic. Technology, this one, um, Again, one thing is you think you know, and these numbers are, I guess the one that um, jumped out at me the most 
was, I get the fourth bullet point down, 80% of them sleep with their phones next to them. Um, an average person checks their phones about 100 times, 110 times a day. And for those of you, I know some of you were probably at World Youth Day, or if you weren't there, you were following it online. Um, people who were there, the young people, they use 12 social media platforms. So we definitely know that, you know, it's not just seeing them on the street. The pictures there actually are from, uh, from Krakow. 92% uh, of them go online daily. So, you know, there there's no running from this. Uh, this is a technology is here, particularly with this generation. And then there's the little ones that are coming. I don't know if anybody's on the this webinar who either teaches or works with um, the little ones, the non-teenagers, but some of people, some people are already calling them the I generation, and to them, social media is not new at all. As a matter of fact, it's not a choice for them. It's the only way that they know of this is how you connect, this is how I express myself, this is how I date. So, you know, unlike the millennials who still um, have used other means, um, the generation that's coming really up right behind them, this is the only media that they use to communicate. So then the question comes, you know, so how do we pair these young people's passions? Um, we, we know what they want to do um, with doing good. We know that they, they believe in service. We know that they believe in community. We know that they like technology. So we here um, at the Pontifical Mission Societies, we, um, we think we have, we have an answer, and we're going to show you a, a little video there, and then I'm going to turn it back to Father Andrew. So if, if our wonderful technician could play that video. Introducing Missio, the latest project launched by Pope Francis. Missio enables real change at the global level by supporting projects that help Solve the world's largest problems. This app lets this app lets anyone choose to take it. seemed a little disjointed to you it seemed a little disjointed to us um, but that might just be the technology this blessed technology which we all <laughs> uh, are supposed to embrace because it makes things um, a little better but we thought we'd sort of conclude we have about 15 minutes or so um, we thought we'd conclude by talking about this new initiative so that we can make it very practical for people who are dealing with this missionary impulse uh, as, as the Holy Father said, when he said that he wants a missionary impulse that can transform everything, he's saying that all of those activities, whether it's uh, the work that we do, so-called in the world, the regular regular employment, bus driving, teaching, etc., uh, but then also that type of work that we do around uh, religious spaces, ministry, um, is imbued with this missionary sense. And what is that? That's obviously a, a going out of oneself. Uh, like, as I said, as the Lord left from the bosom of the Father and uh, the Word was incarnate, it made flesh. That's that, that's that missionary moment, right? That when, the, when the Son was sent by the Father in right? the love that bonds them and the power of the Spirit, that the, the notion of being sent and being missionary originates in the life of the Trinity itself which is made real and manifest in the work of, obviously, the work of Christ and his ministry and his life, his death, his resurrection, that gave birth to the church 
and that finds its uh, privilege moments in the celebration of the sacraments. This is, this is what we know. But its original impetus is this, this missionary impulse uh, which comes from the mind of God and something which we share in, as Mar Marilyn explained, uh, the importance of missionary discipleship. The good thing, I think, for that generation, the ones we just ex we spoke about a little bit, is that it can be oftentimes enslaving if we're told that we have to settle uh, all the problems ourselves. We have to figure out our life for ourselves. And we know that that's not what it means to be a disciple. Obviously, we're a follower. But if we are sent, when we're sent by Jesus, when we're called and sent in our baptism and in the sacraments, then we are sent by another. So we are dependent constantly on that other who is the source and the summit of our life, but also of our unity. Without Christ, uh, our life ceases to make sense. And that sense of community, whether it's in marriage or in family or in church or in group or in nation, uh, can quickly break down without those bonds. We have uh, a, a theological understanding of that that we call the body. We are members of the one body, even though there are different parts, we are all members of the one body. Uh, and that connection, as we just explained over the last 45 minutes or so, spans the entire globe and spans the centuries. When you think about the activities of missionaries here in the United States, we were just talking this morning about the role of Mother Alfred when she went to Dr. Mayo, which is a name that might be familiar with many people. Uh, and she said, uh, we need to, to open a hospital here. And he poo-pooed and said, no, sister, you're a, you're a teacher who's become a nurse, uh, and you don't really understand this, but uh, if you go and get me $2,000, and sure enough, within a couple of months, she came back to Dr. Mayo, and St. Mary's Hospital was founded, and then the Mayo Clinic, which is one of the finest uh, health centers in, in, in the world. And we forget that the impulse, I think, and I would argue, was that missionary impulse of Christ uh, who sees the crowd like sheep without a shepherd, or the mother's relationship with the child within her womb, this chesed, this mercy, this sense of being moved to go out of your own comfort zone. The sisters in Rochester, Minnesota were teachers. They were trained as teachers, but they knew the need uh, was as nurses, so they retrained. And we see that all the time through the history of the church. How can we engage these young folks uh, in this uh, sense, this impulse, as Marilyn just described, this want to see the needs of the world and to respond, to go out, to go forth, to serve the poor, uh, to see themselves to be uh, builders of justice in the world. We know that a lot of this is happening, and we don't want to dig, delve too deeply into why one in three see themselves as probably somewhat spiritual or whatnot, but not particularly identifying with a church. So this is a, uh, something that's quite pressing for us. It's, it's an urgent, urgent concern, as, as Mother Therese, and now Saint uh, Therese of Calcutta, once said, as she was wrestling with what the Lord's call was for her, she heard a voice say, well, they don't love me because they don't know me. The question was, why, doesn't, why don't they love you, Lord? And the answer was, they don't love me because they don't know me. So we should feel that uh, that call echoed in the life of, uh, of Mother uh, and so many other missionaries, and today witnessed by so many other missionary martyrs, as urging us on in a in a in a, in a sense of of urgency. You know that we we have heard this call and we have been. Uh, commission to bring that to others. So what we're proposing is to use something uh, that we've been given, for good or ill, uh, a blessed connectedness. Uh, it's what we're using right now, if you can imagine, uh, to speak to you good folks and for those who will see it hopefully afterwards. They can just click and download or stream. Uh, it's just a remarkable turn of events, which for we who believe in the connectedness of sacraments, faith, even prayer, so we're not even connected. It's not just a this-worldly connection for us. Um, 
when we when we pray obviously we pray to the stain so we pray um, in some way uh, in memory of those whom we loved our prayers mean something right? the content of our faith life has some consequences in this world and in and in and in the heavenly world this is, this is something we should reflect upon so that we don't look at this connectedness of technology as something that is necessarily hampering us or hindering the proclamation of the gospel, since it clearly is some place that many people, if not most folks in our society, are using on a regular basis. And and that's not going to go away. So we have a, an obligation to ensure that we are constantly being evangelized by the Spirit who calls us uh, and asks us to recognize the signs of the times but that we are evangelizing, right? So we don't just accept things as a fait accompli. We know that uh, what God gives us is infused, uh, if it's for the good, infused with his love and his grace, but it's for us to help cooperate with the Lord's grace in our lives so that the good is genuinely done. In a very practical way, we uh, last year launched a, a digital app and application that you can download uh, called Missio, and you can see the uh, little sign there, the thumbprint that you see. And if you go on to the website missio.org, you'll be able to uh, watch that video that at least here we saw a little bit uh, broken up because maybe our, maybe our bandwidth isn't that, <laughs> that good, Marilyn. I don't know buffering. what it is. It wasn't buffering. But you'll see the Missio. Missio is the Latin word for mission. Uh, it's a word that we're using more and more in our, in our literature simply because we think it's a very accessible one, and it's a word that describes the pontifical mission societies in many other countries around the world. And Germany, Austria, Switzerland, in the UK, in Australia, many, many other places uh, are looking to try and to take that long name, the pontifical mission societies in the United States, and to give something accessible that can be used in this medium. So if you see Mistio more and more, if you download it, you go to the website, um, just to understand that that's, that's part of this papal mission societies in the modern era, particularly using modern technology. It started in the digital world, uh, and we'll use that more and more to connect and for other people to connect. It has that, if you see that thumbprint uh, on the screen, and that comes from the inspiration of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. If you remember that, that great picture of creation where the Lord brings Adam to life, even though Eve, uh, if you look at the, that image, Eve is already in God's mind or is already real. So there's a question of how they were co-created in a sense. But the Lord reaches out and Adam comes from this languid state and is created through this divine touch. So the idea is when you're touching this every day, you're, you're looking for your bus schedules or you're deleting something or you're trying to maybe listen to a listen to a piece of music or a YouTube video or, or you're watching this, you liked it so much, you decide to watch it all over again tomorrow. The idea is that, again, it's that, like that little thumbprint so that when you're touching somebody in the mission world's life through the project and through the prayers that we request through Missio, that you're helping to be that creative force in our world. So that's what the thumbprint's about. And you see the Missio, uh, and then the two little eyes that you can see with the little heads on top. They're almost like two people. Because what we discovered is that whilst the church nurtures, convokes, guides, provides a safe platform, a reliable source of the faith, people also want to build those connections in a one-to-one -one level. Community is really a network of one-to-one -one relationships. Oftentimes pastors will see people on a Sunday that come to Mass, uh, come with a family of two or three, but it's often very difficult for those folks to engage each other unless they have volunteers for Thanksgiving or somebody's in uh, catechetical preparation. It's very tough to build that tissue and network. Oftentimes, if there's a crisis in the community, that will bring people together, as we know. So we're recognizing that community is a series of one-to-one -one relationships, and we're, we're, we're not fooled in thinking that there's anything magic that this new technology has brought. Ultimately, the human 
has to reach out to the other human. We have to be touched by one another, uh, comforted by one another, challenged by one another. Uh, and the technology can automate some of that, but the centrality of the human person in all of that in their context is at the heart of the evangelization process. So we value that. Um, as you know, we support many, many uh, countries and missions around the world, and our young people are engaged, but oftentimes they f they're not coming in through the church door, for one, or they're not going to the diocesan events, etc. Et so it's, it's, it's what we've discovered that they are going elsewhere. Now, they might go be, be going elsewhere for their ac activities around the world, their mission trips. Um, they'll do something with college, youth groups, etc., uh, but not necessarily wrapped within the clothes of the faith, and that should be a concern for us. So we need to, we need as, as mission disciples, we need to go out to find them where they're at. And the idea of this app, which is now going to translate into a, um, a robust website and a social media presence over the next few weeks, this is why we're doing this in Mission Month, will give those tools of connectedness to people in dioceses, people in parishes, people in groups, that doesn't depend necessarily on them going to the church on Sunday or going to a website, which we know is often a static thing. Uh, folks will be able to, to see their faith right here while they're looking for their bus schedule or buying their train ticket and all the rest of it. You shouldn't get to your phone and then realize that it's the one place where your faith is not very present, unless you're looking at the news or maybe you're finding the scripture readings, a very, very limited uh, way for us to reflect our senses, sense as members of a community of faith. It's very hard to find this, unless you're doing that in some of the other social media platforms, such as uh, Facebook or Instagram, and we know that those can have uh, not always overly positive uh, effects. So you'll be able to do that and for those who have uh, connections, existing connections with parishes and dioceses uh, around the world. They'll be able to reach out and to share that good news with others in your parish or others in your diocese. If you're in a diocese, you'll be able to see the activity that's going on, which is often uh, happening uh, with uh, sort of very happy ignorance or indifference <laughs> from one another. The idea is that our lives will become more open to be able to be shared with one another. We'll see the good works that are currently going on, which remain hidden. What you've seen so far uh, in the work of the Pontifical Mission Societies is really only a fraction and not a very large fraction of the overall activity that goes on particularly in our world for those who support the church in Africa and Asia, parts of Latin America. It's our job to try and find a way that we can have a good common meeting ground so that folks can do that work, learning from one another, being supported by one another, and also making sure that what they're doing and what they're sacrificing is being used well and the sacrifices are actually reaching the people that they, that they want to get to. So it's moving from uh, the app, which you can currently download if you care to, missio.org, you go to the Google Play or the Apple Store, and you can download Missio. We're having uh, another upgrade of that to, to reflect. But more importantly, it's going to uh, really help when you're able to go onto the web platform and learn more about how you can uh, get your parish involved. Uh, if you're a diocesan leader, you'll be able to see all the activity that's going on, stuff that so far has been often very hidden or is very done on a on a uh, individual basis. And we know in the church we're famous for asking one person to do ten things instead of ten people just to do one thing. Uh, so as we know, the regular folks they can oftentimes get weary over the years and they don't have the energy for it. Um, this will give the ability to to show those good works, particularly the works of mission cooperation and collaboration with others around who are within our Catholic community, but also those who love the work of the church but don't belong to any Catholic engagement. Many folks will have relatives or friends who are not uh, as adherent to the faith as they once were, or folks who are non-Catholics 
but they're excited by what the church does. They heard about the work of the sisters. They know that the church is present uh, around the world. It's very difficult for them to actively engage without maybe going to a group or going to a session or maybe signing up, going to church, etc. So we're trying to provide a place for them to come and to hear about uh, the work of the church and for us to remember that we too need to be missionary. And we can never sort of tell ourselves that we've got it all settled, we've got it all planned, uh, we've got it all we've got to hit the nail on the head. We have to be taking those steps as Pope Francis encourages us time and again to go out of ourselves, out of our comfort zones. Dare I say it, to risk all for the gospel so that others might be saved. And that's what this platform is about. Uh, tune in. Uh, we will be sending out more. and We all, all, all have you uh, connected so that you can uh, learn and listen about the, the, this new sort of full uh, – full plate of an integrated technology from from soup to nuts, I guess. Mm -hmm. Website, Messenger, Facebook, app, all the different ways in which people can engage and then they can engage one another. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Francis, thank you again. And I, I love this picture because I, um, I, I don't know where I found it, but if you notice um, – the young lady is probably wearing her 100% Catholic hat, and she has not one but two pieces of technology um, that she's using um, um, to communicate. And I, I believe that picture did come from World Youth Day as well. So we are. Um, Great. We're, we're actually. I'm looking here, and I we're think getting somebody, close to. We're getting close to yeah. the finish. So um. Finishing time. Good. But there is um, our email there. And so if you want to chat some more with us, if you have some questions, feel free to um, shoot us an email um, or, or, as Father mentioned, go on the website, find a little bit more um, as to what we do. Uh, Father, if you wanted to just get some final words. Sure. We're getting very close to the end. I so, uh, just wanted to thank you all very much for the time. If you've managed to reach all the way to the end uh that's that's good you get special uh, special graces mm -hmm. and favors uh for that and we uh are just offering this initial introduction for us and uh, and hope that you will uh take the time to visit missio.org uh, as that becomes more and more present sign up and we'll we'll give you all the updates on how that rolls out um at the end of mission month we don't want to crowd out world mission sunday on the 23rd but so that you can take Mission Month and Mission Sunday from being just one celebration a year to all year round, so that we can all take that missionary impulse that people are hungry to show, especially our younger people, and to make it real. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your gifts and blessings. We thank you for our vocation, for the desire to have you in our lives, to lead us, the gift of your Son, who calls us always forward, out beyond our comforts, to where your people need us, where they are waiting to hear that message of salvation, the message that brings hope. Make us always faithful. Give us strength, strength, uh, uplift us. Give us faithful heart. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you again, Father Andrew Small and Marilyn Santos for presenting, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and joined us this evening. We'll have a recording of this webinar uploaded to our YouTube page uh, in the next week, so keep an eye out for that, and also on our website, catholicapostolatecenter.org, for the link. You're welcome to share with anyone you'd like. As always, all of our, all of our content is free to share. If you haven't yet found us on social media, please like or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram in the hope that we'll continue to reach more people with spreading the message of the gospel. In the words of our, our, of our patron, St. Vincent Pilate, may the charity of Christ urge you on. Good night, and God bless.